Baking's everyone and welcome to No BS Baking. Got JP here and today we're going to talk about yeast. So without further ado, let's get into it. Yeast produces carbon dioxide gas during fermentation. This gas gets trapped in the gluten matrix developed in the dough, causing the bread to rise and become light and airy. Fermentation also creates organic acids and alcohol, contributing to complex flavors in bread. Longer fermentation times can enhance the depth of flavor. Byproducts of fermentation, including alcohol and enzymes, contribute to the development of gluten, strengthening the dough and giving it better elasticity and structure. Two main types of yeast used in baking is either wild yeast, which can be multiple species, and is naturally present in the air and environment. Then we have commercial yeast, which is a single isolated strain that has been carefully selected for its fermentation strength, consistency, and dependability. Commercial yeast is generally available in three distinct forms, instant, active dry, and fresh. Instant is fine particle size and designed for direct addition to the dough, not requiring any pre-activation. Now the standard application rate is around 1% based on flour. Active dry is the old school style of yeast, usually larger particle size, and pre-activation is usually recommended. Standard application rate is 1.25%. Now, fresh yeast is a soft, creamy yeast, often preferred by bakers for its richer flavor and aroma. The base application rate is 2% based on flour, and it requires refrigeration. Additionally, there is deactivated yeast, often referred to as nutritional yeast. Now, this product is generally available in both flakes and in powdered form. Deactivated yeast is often added to bread products for some or all of the following reasons. It acts as a dough conditioner, improving the extensibility of dough. Its reduction effect on gluten protein provides reduced mixing requirements, reportedly up to 30%, depending on the amount used. Standard application rates are 0.5 to 1.5% based on flour. Besides the reducing effects, it also contributes slight oxidation benefits that contribute to a stronger overall dough. Deactivated yeast is highly nutritious, containing B vitamins, protein, and a number of essential minerals. Commercial and wild yeast both reproduce asexually by budding, where a small bud forms on the parent cell and grows until it eventually detaches and becomes independent. When yeast is added into a dough, it rapidly reproduces. The budding process usually occurs very quickly under optimal conditions. Now, the ideal temperature for yeast reproduction is 24 to 26 Celsius or 75 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. It's one of the key reasons final dough temperature is standardized around 78 Fahrenheit. Now, this is the Goldilocks zone. Cool enough that the dough feels fresh and easy to work with, and not too warm where yeast has been too active, potentially before you even got out of the mixer. A warm dough can quickly become puffy, aged looking, and that's problematic through processing and may result in poor proofing and baking performance. And this is a very common issue with home bakers. Commercial yeast strains are selected for their consistency, predictability, and fast growth rates. They usually ferment sugars quick, quicker and give uniform results in bread making. Now, wild yeast is less predictable than commercial yeast and is affected by the local environment, such as the flour type, water, and air. Now, the resulting bread may vary in rise time and flavor due to the diversity of yeast and bacteria in the culture. Now, I'm not going to get into this too much detail, but I want to make note of common additives that are often added to yeast-raised products that can inhibit yeast activity to varying degrees. Besides the fermentation control aspects of salt, which as you know, slows yeast activity. Sugar, when used above 5%, can also begin to influence yeast activity through its hygroscopic properties, just like salt. Fats at higher levels can put a coating around yeast cells, slowing yeast's access to water and sugars. 
Now, while yeast tolerates mild acidity, too much acid can slow down activity. Spices like cinnamon, clove, and nutmeg contain essential oils that can be toxic to yeast in high quantities. Yeast is often increased when using these spices. Eggs and dairy can inhibit yeast activity. However, usually minor yeast adjustments sorts this out when these are used at higher levels. And alcohol, like used in some holiday breads. High concentrations can slow down or even stop yeast activity. Now, preservatives like calcium propionate, well, that's a no-brainer. They inhibit yeast activity. Excessive enzyme can result in the overproduction of simple sugars, which yeast does consume. However, when simple sugar production is too high, its rapid release can overwhelm the yeast, leading to osmotic stress. This dehydrates the yeast cells, slowing their activity, and in extreme cases, it can kill them. Now, these are things that you don't have to panic about. They're common additives and usually just a little consideration on maybe bumping up yeast levels a bit, depending on how much of these ingredients you use. But most importantly, by understanding the effects of ingredients on yeast, you can better understand why yeast levels may be above standard uh, in some properly put together recipes. However, keep in mind there are many third-party recipes that seemingly have no technical rationale for the yeast levels they use, so be cautious. When water and flour is added in a dough, amylase enzyme present in almost all living things begins to break down starch. Starch is converted to a complex sugar, maltose. This is where another enzyme, maltase, takes over and converts these complex sugars to simple sugars. By consuming these simple sugars, both yeast and bacteria operate similarly, with the exception of the byproduct. As previously discussed, here's a graph that demonstrates the reproduction activity and the optimum temperatures for this process for both yeast and bacteria. Now, the takeaway here is that they both reproduce at similar rates. However, optimum temperature for bacteria far outscales yeast. With that noted, now although temperatures will exceed the optimum reproduction window, yeast does not die. As temperatures increase beyond 80 degrees Fahrenheit or 25 C, the available yeast and bacteria go into overdrive where fermentation really kicks off, producing byproducts like crazy until they hit their thermal death point. For this reason, a good final dough temperature in conjunction with a rest period at a temperature that is under 80 Fahrenheit produces a nice controlled rise with good reproduction activity. Final proofing temperatures can be increased up to a max of about 85. So now let's look at balancing it for a standard bread process. In a perfect world, most bakers try to get their yeast balance for a one hour double in size rest and around a one hour proof time, as you'll note on many of the sites and videos out there. So far, room temperature is in a good range for yeast reproduction, and our final dough temperature is correct, and our salt is at standard levels. This process and timings generally works pretty good for most standard breads. So if 1% is the common yeast standard, and variables are injected into the equation, like a cooler kitchen, or needing to make a really stiff dough, or you want to reduce salt significantly, then note the yeast adjustments that may be required. And likewise, if things are increased in your recipe plan, yeast adjustments may also need to be required. Okay, so you have to adjust yeast. Well, how much? Now, there are science-driven factors which are commonly used in R&D to determine these adjustments, as demonstrated here. The two common baking ingredients that are known for inhibiting yeast performance albeit for totally different reasons. Now these ranges attempt to take into consideration type, i.e. instant or active yeast, and the different brands from around the world. Now I opted for instant dry in this example and selected an application rate on the conservative side of the guidelines. This will give me a very close, if not right on, providing the environmental conditions and final dough temperatures remain true. So let's check it out against a co-pilot recipe I got for sweet bread that includes butter.
This is an AI-generated recipe, and I often say to myself that it produces better, more balanced formulations than many of the online sites and channels out there. Now, I wanted to show you the correlation between industry tech and the AI that incorporates it into its results. This AI-generated recipe says that I needed 2% yeast due to the high sugar and high fat the recipe provided. Now, if you compare that with the industry guidelines I used, then you can see that they're slightly on the conservative side as, as planned. I would always rather wait a bit longer if I needed than have a dough coming too fast. Simply adjust my next go around using the new inhibitor calculator it just added to the baking assistant. Blooming yeast is about activating your yeast prior to adding it into your dough. Now, this was a common practice with early yeast products due to the sketchy manufacturing in the old days issues with stock rotation in the market and various other factors. Many folks would bloom not only because this yeast works quicker with this step, but to check in fact that it actually still worked. Now yeast of today is pretty much foolproof and the chances of getting yeast that doesn't work is pretty slim indeed, unless you pull the pack and used it from your bits and bobs drawer that you forgot you had in there. Now that said, Active dry yeast remains a product that is recommended to bloom in advance as it takes up water slower and ultimately can extend your rise times a bit as it gets into gear. Now, even with pre-activation, this type of yeast is generally requires a touch more than instant and the recommended base start point is 1.25%. Now, instant dry yeast was created to add directly to the dough with no blooming. It absorbs water faster and gets rocking quickly. Now, many folks are locked into the old school thinking and always bloom their yeast, and that's fine. But even active dry doesn't actually require pre-blooming with a minor kick up of around 25% above instant. It does a generally a good job. Proper storage of yeast is essential for maintaining its leavening power and ensuring the best results in baking. Dry yeast, including both active dry and instant varieties, should be stored in a cool, dry place, away from direct sunlight and moisture. Now, once opened, it's best to refrigerate it or freeze dry yeast in an airtight container to extend its shelf life. Under proper storage conditions, dry yeast will last up to a year in the freezer. However, I've had quality instant yeast in the freezer for up to three years with no noticeable degradation in performance. Pressed or fresh yeast, on the other hand, is more perishable and requires immediate refrigeration. It should be stored in the coldest part of the refrigerator, ideally between 0 degrees and 4 degrees Celsius, and used within a few weeks of purchase. If necessary, compressed yeast can also be frozen to extend its shelf life, though most bakers prefer to use it fresh to maintain optimal performance. Now, proper yeast storage ensures consistent dough fermentation and quality results in baked good. Now, regardless of which yeast you got, make note of the expiration date. If you use it beyond that point, then for sure you want to pre-bloom it, just to ensure it still performs as you expect. If you're eager to dive deeper into the topics covered in these videos, I highly recommend getting the Baking Assistant. It offers an extensive collection of ingredient tech and guidelines, formula valuation and building tools, and critical processing insights with new expansions at every month. These updates provide in-depth knowledge that goes far beyond what's discussed in the videos. My goal was to create the ultimate home baking reference and professional level toolkit, and it's already achieving that. But this is just the beginning. There's so much more to come. I got big plans.